thousands of years, mankind has questioned the existence of extraterrestrial life in our universe. Sooner or later, we're going to see some kind of signs of extraterrestrial life. We need to prepare. The chances that aliens exist in some form is highly probable. I think it's entirely likely that there's intelligent life somewhere in the universe. Today, astronomers are already sending messages into space. But what if these messages are perceived as threats and aliens believe humans are the enemy? If they arrived as conquerors, it could be the end of planet Earth as we know it. Is an invasion inevitable? Is this an alien attack? <laughs> it would be like Godzilla meeting Bambi. I think there's almost a 100% chance that there are alien forms of life in the universe other than our own. If extraterrestrials exist, they would come from the far edges of the universe. Their vast spacecrafts may already be en route to our world, and there is no way to know when they will arrive. Many think that this scenario is possible, including researcher Nick Pope, who has worked with the British Ministry of Defense to investigate UFO sightings. There's no reason why intelligent extraterrestrials couldn't already have started their journey. It could be uh, a year's time, it could be a month, it could be a week, they could arrive later today. There's no way to determine whether they would come in peace or what their intentions would be. Extraterrestrial contact with our planet would change life as we know it. <laughs> Nothing would ever be the same. <laughs> the arrival of extraterrestrials could mean extinction for the human race. <laughs> it's impossible to know exactly what would happen, but scientist Ben Moore thinks it comes down to two basic principles. If alien life came here, they would be coming because they were curious or because they were unfriendly. <laughs> Our Earth is just a mere speck in a massive universe. Statistically, scientists believe that this may mean that there could be millions of other civilizations like ours out there. The Earth orbits the Sun, just like seven other planets. But our Sun is not unique. It is only one of more than 100 other billion bright stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And even the Milky Way is just one of a trillion more galaxies. The universe is a very big place. And if you're talking something on the order of a trillion galaxies, each with half a trillion stars, it seems like a fairly silly notion to imagine that we're alone in the cosmos. Some scientists believe it is only a matter of time before aliens finally reach Earth. <laughs> they might be closer than ever before. If there is life, intelligent life, other civilizations in our small part of the galaxy, we will find them in, in just half a dozen years or so. Does life exist in space? The answer might lie within Earth's closest neighbor, the planet Mars. 
Located over 34 million miles from Earth, researchers speculate that Mars is a planet that could support extraterrestrial life. In this infinite universe, the chances are that the same chemical processes that gave rise to life will have arisen many, many times elsewhere. One place that we might find life is within our own solar system. Uh, there are suggestions, for example, that there's microbial life on Mars. In 2003, ESA sent the Mars Express probe to the Red Planet. Its mission, find water, the basic substance of life on Earth. The images from the Mars camera showed something remarkable. Deep valleys that cut through the Mars rock. At one point in time, water must have flowed here. And in some Mars craters, scientists have found frozen water. There are even entire glaciers capping the poles of Mars. But that's not all. We see images of riverbeds, even the image of an ocean. So we do know that Mars was once tropical. It was once lush. Scientists have been able to retrace the entire history of Mars. Four billion years ago, a gigantic sea covered a third of the planet. This water would have been enough to support microorganisms, except suddenly the climate changed. And for some reason, Mars lost its atmosphere and cooled down, and the water evaporated or became frozen within the, the surface soil. It may have had life in the past. But if just a small amount of liquid water is still present, there is still hope for life on Mars. A recent promising sign, strange grooves on the slopes of Mars. These features can occur when water liquefies in the soil and rock slides back over it. Hiding under the barren surface of this planet, there might still be liquid water, water that could mean life. Except on Mars, temperatures can drop as low as minus 121 degrees Fahrenheit. With no atmospheric protection, dangerous cosmic rays can directly strike the planet's surface. Is it even possible for life to survive in these conditions? To discover extraterrestrial life, to find out that we're not alone in the cosmos, it would be one of the biggest, if not the single biggest, discovery of all time. Papa, guck doch mal, ich mach ein Video. Und pass schön auf Mama auf, ja? Extraterrestrial arrival would be a sudden and shocking event. No one would be ready. Our vulnerable planet could be attacked by hostile invaders. there was an alien spacecraft coming into our solar system, we may only have a few days or weeks warning. They are very hard to see. To answer the age-old question of existence of life on Mars, scientists take a deeper look at a continent on Earth that can mimic Mars' icy climate, Antarctica. Researchers from the German Aerospace Center are looking for extremophilic organisms, microorganisms that can handle the harshest cold. They find cyanobacteria, microfungi, and lichens, tiny creatures that can still survive at temperatures as low as negative 58 degrees. These extremophilic organisms clearly show us that life can exist in the most unbelievable places. We find life in the most extreme locations on our planet. So why shouldn't organisms also exist on Mars, which is also an ice-cold desert? At his lab in Berlin, Jean-Pierre de Vera needs to test whether these organisms from Antarctica can cope with even more extreme conditions. 
He has designed a special Mars simulation chamber to put the mosses and bacteria to the test. This is our Mars chamber. We've made it as close as possible to the condition of Mars. These temperatures go extremely low, negative 58 to negative 103 degrees Fahrenheit. To match the paper-thin atmosphere on Mars, the pressure is dropped to six millibars. Air on Earth contains less than 1% carbon dioxide. The air in this chamber is almost 96% carbon dioxide. Under these conditions, most earthly creatures would immediately perish. But the extremophilic organisms from Antarctica survive. So far, what I've discovered in the Mars chamber has been very surprising. Even under the Mars conditions, the fungi could form proteins and bacteria still produced methane. These algae and lichen could still be able to carry out photosynthesis even under Mars conditions. For this reason, we want to take the next step. We need to do these same tests in space. To assist with this study, the International Space Station is called into action for this unique experiment. With a risky setup outside, the astronauts assemble an experimental lab on the external surface of the space station. Several hundred samples, including the bacteria, fungi, and mosses will be exposed to cosmic radiation, orbiting the Earth for over a year. If these organisms can survive in space, they may also have managed to survive on Mars. Life can exist on Mars. Based on the experiments we've done, it's clear that today's Mars is a viable planet. I believe we need to seriously look for life on Mars. Proving simple life exists on Mars would tremendously fuel the greater discussion about intelligent life. Ours will be the generation that makes this literally game-changing discovery that alters everything we know about ourselves and our place in the cosmos. But others in the cosmos may be trying to find our world. Mama, schau mal da. Schatz, ich kann jetzt nicht, ich muss Auto fahren. Da fliegt aber was. Mama, da! There is no way to anticipate where they would land. Their arrival would shock humans. Was denn? Was ist denn? Are they friendly or not? Who knows? I would hope they're friendly, and that first contact would be in a friendly fashion. Humans need to find proof of extraterrestrial existence before they make contact. March 14th, 2016, at the Russian space station in Baikonur, they are launching another new project to find out even more about Mars. ExoMars is a joint project of the European Space Agency, ESA, and the Russian space agency, Roscosmos. The mission is monitored via ESA's control center in Darmstadt. Flight director, Michel Duny, makes sure that the probe stays on course. La mission ExoMars euh, va a une ambition ExoMars mission is to find traces of life on Mars. That could be life that used to exist or maybe even still exists today. Sur Mars. Since on Earth, methane is mostly produced by living things. The trace gas orbiter is designed to detect methane and then find the source of the gas. Ce soit the methane on Mars might be generated by volcanoes. We believe that those volcanoes are now extinct, so it could be produced by minerals, or it could be created by living organisms. In the next phase of the mission, a rover will land on Mars, 
since cosmic radiation makes the surface itself too hostile for life forms. The rover will search for life in the ground. Protected from lethal radiation under the surface, microbes could still be alive. This is the first time in history that a Mars rover will drill two meters deep into the planet. The deeper we drill, the further we can go back in history, increasing the chances that we will find life. The soil samples are examined immediately at the site. A special set of instruments on board the rover analyzes the drill cores for traces of life. But even after all this effort, there is still a chance that Mars may actually be a dead planet. There are still other potentially habitable worlds. The two moons orbiting Saturn, Titan and Enceladus, could hold life in the ice that covers them. Gas giant Jupiter also has its own ice moons, Ganymede and Europa. Underneath their ice crusts, they may have oceans of liquid salt water which could be teeming with life. Our next hot candidates are still in our solar system. We definitely want to look for life on the ice moons. One of these moons is very active, and we can tell that it is spurting out ocean material. That's exactly what we want to see. If something is coming out of the ocean, there could be life in that material. Future missions could finally reveal if there is life in our solar system. Unless highly developed extraterrestrials discover us first, scientists believe they could reach our planet. A species that had evolved for a million years longer than us would certainly have the capabilities to send a starship here. Could these visitors be dangerous? Why do you like that? I have important to ask. Qu'est-ce qui se passe Est-ce que tu veux m'épouser What would such an advanced species want from us Chérie, tu fais quoi Tu fais quoi If aliens decided to conquer our Earth, would we even stand a chance <laughs> Look at it. Look at, Look at it. Look at what? Behind you. If they arrived as conquerors, it could be the end of planet Earth as we know it. If extraterrestrials arrive, they will have traveled a great distance from a planet that is very far from our solar system. How do we identify where they will come from? One man is getting closer to the answer. Swiss astronomer Michel Mayor is on his way to an observatory in France. It was here in 1995 that he made a breakthrough discovery. We have come here to the observatory of Haute Provence to measure as many stars as possible in the clear sky. In just his first week, Mayor was able to pinpoint 142 stars. And there's something very peculiar about one of them. Star 51, Pegasi, seemed to be moving. A small strange wobble that made him think that it could have a planet in its orbit. Looking at them from Earth, most stars appear to have a steady, even speed. But we have noticed that 51 Pegasi actually changed its speed in a very specific way. Mayor has a theory. The gravitational pull of this star holds onto a planet, but the planet itself is tugging back, causing the star to also make a small movement. 
Astronomers call this a change in the radial velocity, which causes a shift in the way the light of the star reaches us back on Earth. As it moves forward, it is seen as bluish. As it moves back, it is perceived as red. Mayor checks these tiny deviations in the light spectrum with his spectrograph. Mayor is positive. 51 Pegasi must have a planet. This was our proof that there was a planet orbiting the star. For the first time ever, an exoplanet has been identified, a planet outside our solar system. The newly discovered planet is located in the constellation Pegasus, 50 light years away from Earth, and it's been given a name, 51 Pegasi b. This was the first time that we found a star other than our sun that actually has a planet. The discovery of 51 Pegasi b is a major milestone in space exploration. We now know for certain that exoplanets exist outside our solar system. The discovery also is another reason why many scientists are convinced extraterrestrials exist, including well-known theoretical physicist Michio Kaku. I think the probability is near 100% that we will find intelligent life in the universe. Do any planets have the potential to support not just simple life forms, but the development of whole civilizations? Could there be a second Earth, a planet exists with the same characteristics as our own? Three, two, engine start, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler. In 2009, the Kepler telescope was launched into space. The telescope's main task, fly through space to search for new exoplanets. Kepler has spotted over 2,000 exoplanets, and the telescope keeps making new discoveries every day. The Kepler satellite has given us a census of the Milky Way galaxy. We know that between 50 to 100% of the stars you see at night have planets going around them. And so the chances that we're the only planet with intelligent life, I think, is very close to zero. To this day, almost 4,000 exoplanets have been discovered. Like Caro 7b. 490 light years away. This planet likely is primarily made up of hot lava. At first glance, planet HD 189733b actually looks like Earth, but it has its blue color for another reason, not water, but hazardous glass particles in the atmosphere with brutal winds of 5,000 miles per hour. It may even rain molten glass on this planet. Fifty-five Cancri E may actually possess a diamond core. The surface is a scorching 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, and the atmosphere of this exoplanet contains high amounts of a toxic prussic acid. Life as we know it on Earth could not exist here. A shadow Earth, or Earth 2.0, I think that's what we'll be looking at. Alien invaders may come from a place much like a second Earth. Then why would they need to come to ours? Aber da fliegt was. Ja, das ist ein Flugzeug bestimmt. Wir fahren ja auch zum Flughafen. Das sieht aber nicht so aus wie ein Flugzeug. Da! Oh mein Gott, was ist das denn? If they truly come to wage war, humans would have no hope. Military experts believe that facing aliens in combat would be devastating. If an alien civilization has the ability to cross interstellar space to reach Earth, they undoubtedly have advanced technology. If their civilizations are more advanced than our own, how can we prepare for contact?
Another scientist is also scouring the skies to find a planet where life is possible. Heike Rauer is an astrophysicist at the German Aerospace Center. The big goal we have is to find planets that are similar to our Earth, habitable ones where we might be able to find life. Heike Rauer knows the key is to find planets with a solid surface and water, the two attributes that seem to go hand in hand with the existence of intelligent life. If I push the Earth closer to the sun, it would get hotter. Some oceans would evaporate, and then we would have a planet that was not inhabitable. And if I push the Earth farther away from the sun, it would be so cold that the water would freeze and we would just have an ice planet. Our planet wouldn't be habitable then either. So there's a specific ideal distance from the sun. We call this area the habitable zone. This habitable zone is the only place where life can develop. But for that to happen, the planet also needs an atmosphere. Like the thin gas layer, which also surrounds our Earth, protecting life from the lethal UV radiation emanating from stars, including our own sun. The atmosphere is also crucial, of course, because we breathe and we need the oxygen from our atmosphere to live. So a planet must also have the right kind of atmosphere. She uses a trick to quickly find habitable planets. Wherever a planet flies past its star, at this precise moment, the star darkens slightly. Using this strategy, researchers like Heike Rauer now have detected more than 30 planets in the habitable zone that could be full of life. One planet looks particularly promising to researchers. Kepler 452b, a planet 1400 light years away in the constellation Cygnus. This planet is amazingly similar to Earth. Its star has a similar size and temperature to our sun. For a round trip around the star, it takes 385 days, just a little longer than our Earth's orbit. And the distance to the star is just right. Getting closer and closer to finding a world very much like our own. I think it's only a matter of time now, and I think it could be staggeringly close. A new European telescope has the means to finally find the second Earth. This advanced device is called the European Extremely Large Telescope, EELT for short. By 2024, the telescope will be stationed in the Chilean desert. It will be the largest of its kind in the world. At the assembly hall of the European Southern Observatory, technicians test the parts that will later become the telescope's main mirror. So what do we have here is the very first prototype of the primary mirror of the ELT. So we need a very large mirror, which is impossible to build today in a monolithic piece. Close to 800 individual hexagonal mirrors will be put together to create the telescope's 40 meter massive mirror. Up to now, we've been building telescope up to eight to 10 meters, but now we have a technology to build something which is extremely large. 40 meter in diameter is as big as the Alliance Arena nearly, and it's enormous. The scientists hope that the telescope's power will finally prove that there is life on an exoplanet. They want to use the telescope to examine the planet's atmosphere. As soon as the planet moves in front of its star, using the color, scientists can determine what kinds of molecules it contains. The ultimate proof is to identify some specific markers, some ozone, for example, some specific elements in the atmosphere of this planet that can only be produced by life, by plants, by, by little creatures in, 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 the, in the ecosystem. With the new telescope, researchers are aiming to find proof of life within the next 30 years. So it's definitely in our lifetime. So in, in, in the next decade, we'll be able with ELT to really understand if there is life, potential life or not. Is it possible that extraterrestrials are already also watching us? 
Are they planning a visit? And for what purpose? Sooner or later, we're going to see some kind of signs of extraterrestrial life. We need to prepare. An extraterrestrial attack would be the greatest catastrophe in human history. Is life out there like on Earth? It probably shares some of those characteristics that life on Earth has. Is there any way to predict what the invaders will look like? Some researchers believe that aliens might be extremely similar to us. I think there's a great chance that uh, some extraterrestrials would look exactly like us. So, for example, eyes are very useful. Uh, legs are very useful for mobility. Those things may be present elsewhere in the universe. So I would not rule out some extraterrestrials being indistinguishable from human beings. Different environmental conditions could mean that life from other planets would look drastically different. These organisms would need to endure extreme heat or extreme cold. If they came from a planet with stronger gravitational forces, extraterrestrials may have adapted and developed massive muscle to fight against gravity's pull. Small compact creatures would have the advantage on this type of planet or a planet with less gravity. Aliens would need much less muscle to move around. Their planet could be populated by thin giants. All life on Earth is made up of carbon and water. But in another world, it's possible that life developed from entirely different chemical elements. On Saturn's moon, for example, there may be no liquid water, but there are still other building blocks that could be combined to form life. So creatures on Titan could use ethane or methane as a liquid instead of water, then the building block would probably be silicon instead of carbon. And those creatures might breathe in hydrogen instead of oxygen. So life could be very alien on that world. There's also the possibility that the visitors will not be actually alive. Aliens could potentially send their own intelligent machines into space. When we actually meet them in person, they may already have bioengineering and artificial intelligence. So don't be shocked to find that they're part robotic and part biological. Many scientists think that it's entirely plausible that aliens have developed advanced spacecraft capable of reaching Earth. Yes, it's perfectly possible to do interstellar travel. It just takes a lot of effort and a lot of money to develop such a spacecraft. The universe to a completely new level. A journey through the stars is already within reach. Russian millionaire Yuri Milner has invested $100 million into the U.S. Breakthrough Initiatives Project. And others are on board, including astronaut Frank Drake and even star physicist Stephen Hawking. It's time to commit to finding the answer to search for life beyond Earth. It is important to us to know if we are alone in the dark. The plan is to visit our neighboring star system, Alpha Centauri, only 4.2 light years away from Earth. Scientists have discovered that in this system, the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri is orbited by an Earth-like planet. Proxima b sits perfectly in the habitable zone, making the planet a prime candidate for harboring extraterrestrial life. But it would take an unmanned probe 32,000 years to reach Proxima b. Milder and Hawking believe we need a mini probe, which will be able to make the journey in only 20 years. If the probe weighed only a few grams, it could be equipped with a sail. Extremely powerful lasers on Earth would then be aimed at the sail. And in just 10 minutes, the probe would be pushed by the lasers at a quarter of the speed of light. For the first time in human history, we can do more 
than just gaze at the stars. We can actually reach them. Traveling at a speed of 45,000 miles per second, it would only take the ultralight spaceship 20 years to reach Alpha Centauri. If sentient life is based upon expansion and based upon exploration, then it's entirely likely that other sentient species are also engaging in interstellar exploration. Advanced civilizations could have developed entirely different technology. Some researchers believe that the most progressive aliens can tap the energy of entire stars to create wormholes that they then use to travel through space and time. We have come from horse and cart to stealth fighter and space rocket in 200 years. Now imagine a civilization with a million year head start, which is not difficult to conceive of in a universe 14 billion years old. So let's not rule out the fact that if there are civilizations out there, they may come knocking on our door. Invasion by a higher tech civilization poses a serious threat to the human race. In an attack, we would barely stand a chance. Humans would need to find shelter and safety as soon as possible. If this crisis would come to fruition, everyone would be caught off guard. But I think it's important to consider the possibility of interstellar species approaching the Earth that might be hostile and consider what resources we might have at our disposal to allow us to defend ourselves. And time may be running out. Aliens may already be heading towards their target, Earth. But some alien hunters are more optimistic. One of the most famous hunters believes that aliens will be peaceful. Seth Shostak has devoted 50 years of his life to SETI research, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The American astronomer is convinced that his body of work will pay off. They're like a trillion, so that's a million, million planets just in our galaxy. It's like you bought a trillion lottery tickets. You know, a couple of them are going to be winners. So it just strikes me as inevitable that there is other intelligent life out there. Someday, we may be able to actually communicate with extraterrestrial civilizations, but are they already trying to get in touch with us? To find out, SETI researchers use radio telescopes, like the Allen Telescope Array in California. These telescopes can receive acoustic radio signals from deep within the universe. We point them in the direction of nearby stars, which we think might have planets, which might have life which might have intelligent life and we just look for signals that are coming from those directions signals at one spot on the radio dial that would tell us hey you know i don't know what they're saying i don't know what they look like but they've built a radio transmitter and once upon a time a signal just like this one reached earth 1977 the big ear radio telescope of the ohio state university has its antennas aimed directly into space Using these antennas, the telescope could capture every radio wave lying in its orbit, and suddenly it received a strange signal from space. Astrophysicist Jerry Amon was working on the Big Ear Telescope. He could hardly believe it when he analyzed the recorded data. In those days, all the data were just printed out as numbers on a big printer, and he would just go through it and look, see if there was anything interesting that had happened the night before. One morning, he finds a big signal, and he gets so excited about it, he writes, wow, next to it. This wow signal came from the constellation Sagittarius, 200 light years away from Earth. With a 30-fold standard deviation, the signal was strong enough to be heard over the background noise of the universe and it may have been sent out by another civilization. But the wow signal was never detected again. To this day, it is unclear if it is a result of something natural or if it was caused by something else. If extraterrestrials are sending signals to us, what would happen if they personally paid us a visit? People would respond in many, many different ways. 
Uh, some people would literally uh, panic in the streets. There's no connection. Oh. Okay, uh, nobody knows what's going on. People are freaking out. Hey, Chaos and violence would strike the cities of Earth. Hey. Our world as we know it would collapse. There's somebody coming. Let's get out of here. Please, just go. Fear, shock, panic, anger. It's entirely likely that humans would be terrified. At the SETI Institute in California, Seth Shostake and his colleagues are still looking for recent signals. The astronomers evaluate data from radio telescopes all over the world. To date, they have not found any evidence proving that extraterrestrials exist. Therefore, many scientists criticize SETI search methods. See, we look for radio signals from intelligent uh, planets, but that's looking at the wrong frequency. Why should they use old-fashioned radio to communicate? The alien hunters have not given up. To finally get in touch with extraterrestrials, some SETI researchers think that we should play a more active role in communication. Instead of listening to distant signals, our own messages should be sent into space. If you send to some nearby stars, so they're not terribly far away, 10 light years, 20 light years, then maybe you get a response while you're still alive and can enjoy a response. It would not be the first time that astronomers have sent a message to aliens. In 1977, the Voyager 1 probe made its way into space. Since then, it has reliably sent back data and images from our solar system. Precious cargo is stored on board. The golden record, a copper disc, that holds music, images, and sounds from the Earth. <laughs> Greetings recorded in 55 different languages, a way to kindly introduce ourselves to foreign civilizations. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Herzliche Grüße an alle. Bonjour tout le monde. Konnichiwa, o genki desu ka? Hola y saludos a todos. In 2012, Voyager 1 became the first probe to leave our solar system. It has flown further into space than any man-made object ever before. This cosmic message in a bottle will travel even deeper into interstellar space. By 2025, the probe will run out of its energy supply and continue into the cosmos uncontrolled. Would the aliens ever find these spacecraft? I don't think so. They're about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, right? And they're dark, and, and their, their transmitters won't be working then. So how are you ever going to find these guys? I mean, it's like, you know, looking for, a, a, I don't know, a, a little bit of flotsam on the Pacific Ocean. You're probably never going to find it. Acoustic signals are already being sent out into space. The most famous signal was the Arecibo message in 1974. The message created by astronomer Frank Drake used binary code to provide information about human biology, the population on Earth, and tell the recipient exactly where the signal originated. So far, we haven't received a reply from aliens. Seth Shostake thinks we need to be thinking bigger. In fact, he wants to offer big data to the aliens. The more information they receive, the better they will understand us. I would send the internet, actually. I would just send everything on the internet. I mean, if you walk down to the beach and you find a message in a bottle and it's one sentence, you may never figure out what that message was about. But if it was, you know, a thousand books, well, you, might, you might figure out a lot more. But others think that these well-meaning messages would make us incalculably more vulnerable. Enemy aliens might leverage these communication efforts into a full-scale attack. I think it's a, a rather silly idea to send out powerful beamed messages um, indicating our presence. Who knows what's out there in our galaxy? It's like being a four-year-old in the middle of a dark forest. Uh, does she explore and learn the situation? 
or does she go running, screaming through the forest saying, Monsters, hello, everybody, I'm here. Critics say that stopping these messages is the only way to prevent a human catastrophe. Before proceeding, there needs to be a greater scientific discourse about what these messages should contain and who is allowed to send them. I think we should hold discussions, serious scientific investigations and discussions of the pros and cons before we be messages into space. Early projects like Yuri Milner's are already underway. For the best message that could be sent to extraterrestrials, a reward of $1 million is up for grabs. Though we previously also warned against sending messages, Stephen Hawking now supports the endeavor. It is time to open our eyes, our ears, and our minds to the cosmos. If extraterrestrials received our signals long ago, now it's too late for us to hide. Any society that could do that, any society that could come here and threaten you, they've got bigger antennas than we do. They can already pick up our television, our airport radars, all sorts of stuff. So we're already telling them we're here. Pandora's box might already be open. At this very moment, aliens could be en route to Earth. If there are more intelligent, more powerful, and therefore more dangerous civilizations out there, we should be very careful uh, about contacting them. These fears are not unfounded. In the history of mankind, when a new country or continent is discovered, it is always ended tragically for those who are conquered. The less technologically advanced culture experienced pain. In some cases, death and extinction. In some cases, slavery. An invasion of militant aliens could end the human species. If the battle begins, those who could hide in time would be the only survivors. Aliens would need a motive to fight Earth. It is possible to conceive of other civilizations who are at war in the cosmos and who are perhaps desperate for new territories or, or new resources, they may look at the Earth and say, this could be our new home. Would universal war with extraterrestrial life be plausible solely for our resources? With so many planets out there orbiting stars that will have water and carbon and all the elements that are on Earth, there's no reason to come to a planet filled with life. This is an alien attack. <laughs> Our planet is home to 7 billion people. To aliens, the most interesting resources on Earth might actually be its inhabitants. If they are warlike, it would be like Godzilla meeting Bambi. It would be no contest whatsoever. Is there any way to prepare for this kind of disaster? Space agencies have emergency procedures to respond to dangers like meteorite impacts. Do they also have a plan in case of an alien attack? Scientists and military experts have already thought through what would really happen in an attack situation. An alien civilization approaching Earth as a potential target for conquest is going to first try to eliminate any kind of resistance. The simplest thing they can do to neutralize our weapons is to use the electromagnetic pulse. Without warning, all energy supplies would be shut off. Electronic devices, cars, and telephones would be useless. And humans would be suddenly powerless.
you would essentially drive human civilization back into the 19th century. Earth's largest cities would be targeted first in an invasion, and most would not survive the brutal war. I'm sure that many of the nations of Earth would use nuclear weapons, even on their own soil, as a last resort to try to stop some form of alien invasion. Using weapons of mass destruction would destroy our own planet. Luckily, there is also another strategy. The first objective would actually just be survival. The second priority would be the capture of enemy technology and reverse engineer them it may be possible for us to produce them in significant quantities. Even if aliens haven't planned a deadly invasion, it could still turn into war if we get in their way. And even if the aliens don't want to conquer us, even if the aliens don't want to eat us, even if the aliens don't want to plunder our natural resources, we might get in the way because maybe they have different intentions toward us. <laughs> Humans would have no way to escape. We still don't know what's going on. We're weak in ourselves on the ground. <laughs> if an enemy arrives that has such a massive disparity in their technological capabilities that you have no means of potentially fighting back, then perhaps your best opportunity to survive is to accept the changing nature of your civilization. If they came here with friendship, uh, as explorers, that's great. We would hold out the hand of friendship ourselves. If they came as conquerors, I think we would simply uh, have to surrender. This would be a war we could not win. <laughs> Only one thing is for certain. Extraterrestrials' arrival would change our world forever. The only hope is that if they do come, they will come in peace.